everybody. I just want you to know I need your prayers because Tuesday I'll be 73 and I want to make it. <laughs> uh, I'm reading the scripture today and it's from John 13, 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Good morning, church. Thank you for that reading. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Grab your Bibles and let's say this together. This is my Bible. It contains God's will for my life. I can become what it says I can become. Today, I will study from his word. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never again be the same. Amen. As you see on your handout and as flashed on the screen, I want to be talking about the oxygen of the kingdom. We ended up last time by saying salvation is free. But being a disciple of Jesus will cost you everything. We talked, we've talked about the lordship of Jesus. We've talked about the gospel of the kingdom of God. We've talked about the fact that we were slaves in that kingdom. We even talked about living in that kingdom. And today I want us to talk about love. You know, it's easy to get caught up because we're not used to being, we're not, we're not used to understanding the concept that we're slaves. So it's easy to get caught up in the idea that, well, what's all of this about? Well, first of all, being a slave to Jesus Christ is a lot different than being a slave to, say, Satan. Vastly different. And so I want us to talk about what gives the kingdom of God its oxygen, that being love. You know, in my early life as a kid, I remember growing up thinking that love is, is important. I knew my parents loved me. I knew I was loved by others. But I, I sort of thought, well, it's just, it's just another one of those Christian virtues. And then one day somebody introduced me to the word agape. I don't know how to say this other than to say that our English language, when, we, when, it, when it comes to this word, stinks. It is, it is horrible, horrible. It's used horribly in the Bible. It's almost like we, you know, in our society, we love onions, we love our Chevy, and we love God. We love our moms. It's all mushed together. But in the Greek, it was very specific. And I'm going to substitute agape a lot this morning for love to try to maybe help us keep it in our mind. Agape is the very highest form of love that's possible. It is the love of God for man, for God so loved the world. It's a selfless love of one brother, one sister to another without sexual implications and especially being spiritual in nature because that's really what God's kingdom is. It's the opposite of phalotia, self-love. We'll have more to say about that in a moment. When you think about eternal life, what do you think about most? Isn't it true that most often when we think about term, term, uh, eternal life, we think about longevity or length of that life? But if that's all there is to eternal life, then hell is a form of eternal life. So quality then is what I want us to emphasize this morning. What Jesus offers us had to come way beyond our world. He came here as a baby and then grew up showing us what love was. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen what? 
you've seen my father. You've seen me. You watch what I do, how I think, how I react. That's exactly how my father would react. One of my favorite scriptures is this. No, we speak God's secret wisdom. A wisdom hidden in and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it's written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. That would be a marvelous thing to have on the refrigerator. Think about this. God, before time began, had in his wisdom a plan. Notice in verse 2, God destined it for our glory. Nobody in the world got it. If Satan and everybody connected to Satan had figured out the plan, they wouldn't have crucified the Christ. But then he says, no matter how much you think about it, how much you, you conceive, how much you plan, how much you made, you know, just what heaven is like, we just absolutely don't know. This quote comes from Isaiah, which says, since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Isaiah said, there's, there's just nobody like God who is patient and will wait and has, has your interest at heart. He acts on behalf of those who wait on him. We're going to talk a little bit about several texts this morning from Corinthians. The Corinthians were relying on human wisdom to address problems in the church. They were also valuing worldly intelligence and worldly wisdom way above the message that the Holy Spirit inspired. Now that could have been written about our day. I, I don't mean to imply that we as a church are doing this, but human wisdom is what people are using in the world to solve problems. Worldly intelligence, worldly wisdom has gotten what? Into war after war. People are dying in the Ukraine because people use human wisdom. Earthly wisdom doesn't come from God. Earthly wisdom is narcissistic. I always wondered where that little word came from. It came from a, a poet who lived in 8 AD, a Roman poet. And he wrote about this guy. His name was Narcissus. And he wrote about this guy. He was handsome. Uh, and people, girls would come and they would try to date him and have a relationship. And he would reject him and reject him. And finally, they sent this little nymph named Echo. He rejected her and the gods cursed him and said, for the rest of your life, you will look at your face in a mirror in the pond. And he did. And he realized that that reflection could not respond. That reflection had no warmth. And so finally, he just dried up and died. I wish <clears throat> narcissism was as easy to deal with as that. Someone who's narcissistic is someone who thinks only about themselves. They are way over the top, preoccupied with what they want, what they need. Nobody else is under consideration. I would say that in 2023 in America, there are 
a lot of people who are narcissistic. Evil wisdom, wisdom earthly wisdom <clears throat> is evil. I keep hearing these things, and so I keep bringing them to the front. A mother this week here in California was shocked out of her mind when they found out that they were trying to transition her daughter without her knowledge. How do they do that? Well, they just pass a law with the school board that says the parents don't have any right to know what's happening to this child. So I keep saying to people, just because it's all quiet and it looks good, you need to investigate. Earthly wisdom is evil. Earthly wisdom has one purpose. That is to lead us astray. If we were a sheep in real life and we got astray from the rest of the flock and no one came to get us, something would devour us and destroy us. And that earthly wisdom is designed with that specific purpose in mind. So how do we know about God's wisdom for our glory? Well, God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Isn't that neat? Hello? Don't go to sleep on me. I'm not done yet. I'm almost halfway done, but don't, 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 don't tune me out. God has revealed to us by his spirit that we are able to know the wisdom of God. So the quality of eternal life that Jesus offers, well, it's beyond, any, beyond the pale. Oxygen, love is the oxygen without which there is no life. That's physically, that's also spiritually. The element that we must have, that we must possess as disciples, if we're going to be able to function in the kingdom of heaven, is love. Light, love is light. Listen to this. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, if I don't, if we don't have fellowship with each other, we don't have fellowship with God, and therefore God will not cleanse us from our sin. My relationship with God depends on my relationship with you. Whoever loves his brother, whoever loves his brother, that's the word agape, lives in light. And there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. So if, if I'm blinded by evil, I'm blinded by relying on worldly things, I stumble around in the darkness and I put things in front of my brother because I can't see and he stumbles as well. But if I choose to live in the light, love is in the light. What is darkness? You know, we don't... <clears throat> <laughs> it's just simply the absence of light. We don't have to buy darkness. We don't take big sacks of darkness and, and bring them in. We just turn out the light. In the kingdom of darkness, it's a lonely place. In the mid-90s, we lived in Russia, and there were always blackouts. Just... <laughs> They did have to have a reason. Maybe they wanted to turn it off to fix something next door. Maybe there wasn't enough power. It didn't really matter, but it would go off. And the kids of all the parents, when this would happen, they would go, Mom, are you there? You know, when you think about it, we're the same place. We were just seconds before the light went out. 
In the daytime, we go everywhere. We go to the cemetery. Now, we don't go to the cemetery at night. We used to. It's against the law. But as a rule, people don't go to the cemetery at night. Some people are freaked out about it. And my question is, are the dead any more dead of a night than they are of a day? Is it not the darkness, the loneliness that has the effect on us? Darkness is associated with individualism, selfish evil, all right? There's that narcissism again. Light is love and fellowship. Totally opposites. Whoever loves his brother lives in light and is nothing in him to make him stumble. I want to quickly reflect just two seconds because I don't ever want us to repeat this, but our pastors of brotherhood had some bad times. There were times when God's people were stumbling over each other. Brother against brother in darkness, claiming to be in light. And yet as I, I stumbled around, even using God's word to validate things, it was obvious that I was in darkness because of my spirit, because of a lack of humility. I pray to God we never, ever, ever, ever go down that road. When that happens, then from the text we just read, it becomes obvious that one or the other of disciples are not living in light. Would you like a strong assurance of your salvation? Would, is it important to you to know whether you're saved or not? Well, you can do that. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. There is not a reason for a person to end the day who can read the word of God and not understand that they have the ability to know whether or not they have a relationship with God. If we claim, if we make the claim to have fellowship and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. I can make the claim, but if I'm not, I don't have the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Mm. You want to know if you're a murderer? You want to know if you're dead and now you're alive? Or you think you're alive and you're dead? Not hard. We know we pass from death to life. We know this because we love our brothers and anyone who does not agape his brother remains in death. Now, it sounds easy. It rolls off the tongue. It reads well. But in reality, sometimes loving is hard. I know it's never hard to love me, Mike. It's hard sometimes. I make it hard. But I can know that I was dead and I am now alive. That I passed. Or anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. No murder has eternal life. And he goes on and talks about Cain killing Abel. Well, yeah, murder doesn't have eternal life. But if I hate my brother, if I'm not actively working to make things good and right and better and well with my brother, then I stand in that state. Quick introspection. Take us about 60 minutes. How am I doing in my walk with Jesus. I'm not talking about perfection. But when you read this, don't, mis don't, don't misconstrue that. I'm talking about faithfulness. 
How am I doing with Jesus? How is my walk with my brothers and sisters? Again, I won't be perfect, but do, do my brothers and sisters know that I love them? You can teach right, eat all the Lord's Supper, give cheerfully, and on and on and on. But if you don't actively agape those you're on the journey with, you're not going to heaven. And I don't get a thrill out of saying it. It's not, well, I, I don't like them and I'll never forget what, I'll, I, I, don't, I don't hate them, but I'll never forget what they did. That's garbage. That's the wisdom of the world. Active agape, for God so loved the world, agape the world that he what? Gave his one and only son. That's the action of agape. So we can see why love is the oxygen of the kingdom. In Jesus' day, people would make a whole day's journey in order to go around Samaria. Who were the Samaritans? Samaritans were <clears throat> a few thousand Jews that were left behind when the Babylonians took Judah into captivity. And Babylon sent in some of their people, and so over the 70-year period, they intermarried. And when the Jews came back, they said, well, these Samaritans, they're dogs. They're not really Jews. It's amazing to me, one of the most interesting stories in John 4 is Jesus and the woman at the well. Man, it tells me so much about Jesus and how he thinks about me and his interaction with that woman blew him away. And his disciples are over there, you know, they went into town to get some, some mac and fries and they're over eating their fries and, and Jesus is over there talking to the woman and thrilling her soul so much even though she found out she's flat dead in sin. She goes into the town and brings the people out and says, let me tell you, I just met a man who can tell you everything, I, tell me everything I ever did. You go, I ain't going. But they came. Maybe out of curiosity. I don't believe you. Nobody can do that. Oh, you really? Well, come on over. I'll, let me introduce you to this man. I think his name was Jesus. Amazing story. Jesus had to go through Samaria. I wondered, I, this is this is just Jerry chapter 1099. I wonder if Peter didn't try to say, Lord, re, 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 do we really need to go that way? I, I mean, you know, it won't take us too long to go around over here. And, you know, they got that special place to eat and the, the, the great fish they sell over here. And I don't know. That sounds like Peter, doesn't it? That's what I'd probably done. Lord, why, why, why get over there, man? We'll get, we'll get cooties from those Samaritans. This is the covenant. I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. Quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 and following. Where was it before? Well, it was written on stone. Where was it after they got tired of carrying it around? Well, they put it in, the, in a drawer of the Ark of the Covenant under that mercy seat. Where was the law intended to be? On the heart. I still believe that the first generation Israelites that came out of captivity understood that. I think after a thousand years or so, when you come down to Jesus, they've forgotten the purpose of it. But I think those first Jews, when they remembered killing that animal and putting blood on the doorpost, and then the death angel passing by... <laughs> You wouldn't forget that for a while. So the laws are intended not to be external. Not out here somewhere, not something I've heard and I don't respond to, but something that is written in my mind so I can understand it and written on my heart so that I can feel it. The fruit of the Spirit is agape plus seven others in the text of Galatians. 
Agape is not just another element. It is the one thing that cannot be done without. Jesus never said, you will know my people by their gifts. The emphasis is on the fruit. He said, by their fruit, you'll recognize it. You'll, oh, yeah. You and I go to a nursery and we don't go fumbling around over, you know, the peach trees looking for a what? A citrus tree. That's dumber than a stick. Somebody came over and said, uh, Mike, I'd like to sell you this uh, uh, apricot tree and it's citrus. You, you need to get out of there. If you're looking for oranges, you're going to only find them on a tree that grows oranges. In the days of the miraculous gifts, there were nine of them. In the days of those gifts, they did not indicate spirituality. In fact, at the church in Corinth, they actually just simply announced that there was something carnal going on. People had a gift and they go, hey, look at my gift. Listen to this. Watch this. The person who was spiritual with the gift was the person who controlled the gift. Again, that narcissistic idea. Those gifts were sort of like real Christmas trees. Okay, hang, hang on here. I realize this, this illustration has some weaknesses. But let's suppose... Uh, Suppose you get a Christmas tree, and you, you cut it down first, and you know it's going to die, and you bring it into an environment that's hot. And by the way, I'm not against cutting down Christmas trees and bringing them in your house. You can bring them in here. I don't care where you bring a Christmas tree. I, I like them all decorated and sparkly and dazzling and all the other things that go with it. But suppose that happens. And we take this Christmas tree, and we put all kinds of nice gifts under it. Maybe we, we take watches and we put them in the branches and we, you know, we put money in the branches or cards full of money in the branches. We do all of that. And then on January 1st, where is it? Kick to the curb, waiting for the junk man. So in that illustration, you can't judge much about the tree on the basis of its gifts. If we were to see it with an apple tree, why watches on it? If it would talk, it would say, well, I, I, I don't, because nobody put any watches on me, on, on my branches, I don't have any. I'm an apple tree. And that would be right. The apple tree gets slack cut there, but it doesn't, it's an apple tree, so it must have what? Apples. Jesus looked at the fig tree and said, mm-mm. Jesus didn't say all men will know you're my disciples if you possess one of nine or all the nine spiritual gifts or if you prophesy. Samson prophesied. He was as carnal as they come. If I speak, I'm going to read this. So if you want to read it in your Bible, I'll read the whole thing. I know it's a lot, but I want to read it. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels... But have not agape, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not agape, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames and have not agape, I am nothing. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It isn't rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
Agape does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Agape never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Whether there's knowledge, it will pass away. Because uh, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when a perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a, I was a child, I, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Still talking about agape love and the lack thereof, he says, now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. But we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and agape. But the greatest of these is love. This chapter wasn't written for weddings. Though, it's definitely applicable. Here's who it was written to. I appeal to you, brothers, Paul said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Paulus, another I follow Cephas, still another I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified you? Were you, were you baptized in the name of Paul? That's the group of people that chapter 13 was written to. And so with a bucket load of things that he says are important, if I don't agape my brothers and sisters, I am just a big noise. You know, you can, if you're going to be asleep, you're awake now, but you hear something like that and it just freaks all, I'm just like, what? That's all I am. People don't want to be around me. People don't want anything to do with me. You can manage to live without some things, <laughs> oxygen, three or four minutes, and you're brain dead. I know from personal experience that if I'm going to be part of the kingdom of heaven, I must have this gift of oxygen. I end with this scripture. My shepherd knew I was going to preach on this, and so he said to me a couple weeks ago, by the way, if you're going to preach on this, you need this scripture. And I have to say, to my shame, I, I didn't intend to use it. Thank you, Larry. This is what I could have started with. We could have had a prayer and gone home. Listen to this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, agape Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Listen now. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, over all of them, and they're great. We just read them. Put on love, which binds them all in perfect unity. Wow. That one would be on my refrigerator if I had a big enough refrigerator. You see, that's what I was trying to say through all of this. Without the love in the kingdom of God, it's nothing. People arguing and fussing and fighting and over this and over that. All these Things are just issues that have to do with personality. Nothing with truth that I know in my lifetime. But I need to put on love. 
And that will bind gentleness, humility, and patience, and all of those things together in a unity that will honor God. Maybe sometimes you feel like you're choking and you just, you don't get enough love. Or maybe you and I are all just, maybe Jerry just needs to slow down enough to look for people and see people and see, can I just say something? Can I do something? Can I send a text? Can I go for a cup of coffee? Can I do something? Because love can make a huge difference. You ever, you ever had someone call you or someone talk to you and you were just, you know, you get sitting on a postage stamp digging your legs. And when they got through talking to you, you're like, wow, I think I'm going to make it through today. That's what we are as God's people in a family. If you're here today and not part of God's eternal kingdom, think about it. Jesus is ready, always ready. He has been standing at the right hand of the Father since he ascended back to heaven. That's the picture we're given. And he's always waiting for the one who gets the message of how much he loved the world. Mike's going to lead us in a song. If we can serve you, let us know. Are you there?